Hello, I'm Robert, uh, Robert Walker, and I'm going to be on Dr. Livingstone's The Space Show this Friday, talking about my new booklet, Case for Moon, Positive Future for Humans in Space, Open-Ended, with Planetary Protection at its Heart. So, I thought I'd just read out the executive summary, which I've been working out to outline the basic ideas behind it. The Moon is our nearest unexplored territory outside Earth. To ignore it is like ignoring Antarctica after the first few landings in the 19th century. Why rush humans as quickly as possible to distant Mars, the one place in the inner solar system most vulnerable to Earth microbes? The Moon is resource-rich, with volatiles at the poles, possibly hundreds of millions or billion tons of them, with water, ammonia, and carbon dioxide. It has many metals and nanophase pure iron in the megalith, also measly made into glass. It has a high-grade vacuum for chip manufacture. It has many advantages for human base, including the peaks of eternal light and possibly enormous lunar caves. It is of great interest for science, with many new discoveries to be made. It is far safer than Mars, as a first destination for humans. There are many places other than Mars to settle and perhaps colonise. We don't know which gravity levels humans need for health or what spin rates we can tolerate. You can't draw a straight line between the effects of zero-g and full-g based on two data points. Everything humans need in space is available in the asteroid belt, sufficient to build full-g spinning habitats with a thousand times the land area of Earth. Terraforming Mars is a far-off dream. We are not yet mature enough as a civilization to see this thousands of years long mega-technology project through to completion. Failed attempts would introduce new life forms to Mars which may get in the way of future goals. Earth is the best place for a backup and to rebuild civilization. We live in a quiet galactic region at a quiet time in our solar system. None of the proposed disasters could make Earth as uninhabitable as Mars. Living Earth as the leaving Earth as the best place to rebuild. While if our technology is the problem, surely the solution can't be to set up one of the most highly technological societies ever in space. As a young technological civilization, we should have protection and sustenance of our home planet as first priority. A trillions of dollars mega technology backup attempt could distract from this. We can use our space technology to protect Earth against asteroids, to move damaging mining operations into space, for solar power, and for scientific discovery. Mars has much more potential for surface and near-surface habitats for indigenous life than realised before. These habitats could host life forms that are vulnerable. For instance, early life based on RNA and ribozymes instead of ribosomes, out evolved on Earth by DNA-based life. We have protection guidelines on Earth to stop microbial contamination of vulnerable habitats, such as Lake Vostok, an isolated lake below 3.5 kilometres of ice in Antarctica. Humans would not be permitted to descend into this lake at present. Mars can be explored from orbit more effectively than from the surface using telerobotics. Humans in clumsy spacesuits don't have special advantages over telerobots on the Mars surface. From orbit, you can teleport via telepresence to anywhere on Mars with immersive virtual reality experience of the surface. We have miniaturized life detection instruments on a chip that just a decade ago filled an entire laboratory. In page 2041 of Safe on Mars, which is so often quoted, they say, if such capabilities were to become available, one advantage is that the experiment would not be limited by the small amounts of material that a Mars sample mission, return mission would provide. What is more, with the use of rovers, 
an in-situ experiment could be conducted over a wide range of locations. These are now the most effective way to search for Mars life, past and present, as eight exobiologists said in a white paper for the Decatur Review. With our recent complex understanding of Mars processes, a sample return will not prove that Mars is safe for humans or that humans are safe for Mars. We should return samples from Mars either sterilised or to above GEO or both, at least for preliminary investigation. It is far easier, both physically and legally, to return them to Earth after we know what is in them. Otherwise, we're left with the daunting task to design for safe handling of any conceivable Mars exobiology based only on knowledge of DNA-based life. If we show that human exploration of the Moon is of value for Earth, this will help human exploration of the rest of the solar system, not hinder it. The same open-ended principle should be used for all our exploration in space. Rather than grand overarching plans, we need an open step-by-step -step approach. At each stage, we learn from what we have found so far and can adapt and change our goals rapidly. Until we know a lot more than we do now, we should not close off future possibilities for ourselves, our descendants and all future civilizations on Earth, but should keep all options open. In this approach, planetary protection and biological reversibility are core principles. The Moon in this vision is a gateway to the solar system, a place to develop new techniques and explore a celestial body that is proving much more interesting than expected. Along the way, we are bound to get human outposts in space and colonisation may happen also. However, settlement in space doesn't need to be the driving force any more than it is a driving force behind the study and exploration of Antarctica. If we try to turn Mars and other places in space into the closest possible imitations of Earth as quickly as possible, this may close off other futures, like the discovery of vulnerable early life on Mars or better future ways to transform Mars. Once we develop the ability to live in space for years at a time, the whole solar system will open out to us. While keeping future options open on Mars, we can explore Venus, Mercury, asteroids, Jupiter's Callisto and further afield, and Mars itself via telepresence. We also have many experiments in human settlement to try, closer to hand, on the Moon. This can be an exciting future, with humans working together with robots for remote exploration as our mobile sense organs and hands in the solar system and galaxy. So then, if you want to read the rest of the booklet, I'll add a link to it. It's available as a free online booklet. It's also available for Kindle, and you can also read it without the table of contents on my Science 20 blog. And I'll also give a link to the, um, to the Space Show, the page for my appearance on the Space Show, and you can also listen to it live on Friday and maybe ask questions and so on. Uh, thanks for listening. And of course, if you have any questions or any suggestions or anything, then do say in the comments. And I'd just like to mention that we have a Facebook book, a Facebook group called the uh, Case for Moon. And I, I started it when I discovered this. There doesn't seem to be any groups at all on Facebook, even for studying Moon First for and uh, discussing Moon First ideas. So it's quite an eclectic mix. It's not just people who have the same vision as this, but anyone who is thinking in terms of Moon First. So do be uh, feel free to join it if you're interested in discussing this with other enthusiasts about the idea of starting off with the Moon as the first destination for humans in the future. <laughs>